Welcome to day one of our reading and our commentary and our reflections on the Holy Scripture. It's going to be awesome, okay? Now, just as just for a brief introduction uh, to this whole series, I just want to let you know that we're going to go through this co- uh, chronologically, okay? Some of you might say, why do it chronologically? Because, I mean, it, for example, if you take the Bible and you pick it up and you read from cover to cover, it's easy to get confused. It's easy to, um, you know, to not piece things together as it should be, like chronologically, as in, you know, in the order that things happened. And, you know, it's just, it's very, it's very important to understand the order that, that things happen. And the Bible really isn't, you know, put together in a chronological order. So uh, we're going to do it chronologically. And also, I'm going to pronounce the names of these, uh, the, the, the biblical characters and the, the characters that we find in the Holy Scripture. I'm going to pronounce them in their original Hebrew pronunciation as, as best as, you know, as, as best as possible. Um, you know, for example, I'm not going to say Abraham because that's not the way it was actually pronounced in, in, in the ancient times. I'm going to say Avraham. You know, I'm not going to say um, Jacob. I'm going to say Yaakov. Okay, I'm not going to say David, I'm going to say Daud. I'm not going to say Jesus, I'm going to say Yeshua. I'm not going to say, you know, Isaiah, I'm going to say Yeshiahu, okay? I'm going to I'm going to pronounce it in the way that it was really pronounced, okay? I'm not, I'm also going to use uh, the English pronunciation from time to time as well. Now, also what I'm going to do is I'm going to pronounce the name of God in the original way that it was pronounced. Now, we got plenty of evidence that the name of God was originally pronounced, okay? In spite of what some people believe that it should not be pronounced, we, we know, uh, as far as we can see, that, you know, the children of Israel in the time of Moshe, Moses, uh, that, you know, it, basically all the way through biblical times, uh, pretty much at least, uh, it was pronounced. And so I'm going to pronounce it as... Um, as I believe it was originally pronounced, okay? Some people might say it, it's pronounced Jehovah. Well, no, it's not. Uh, and some people think it's Yahweh. Well, it's a little bit closer, but I think that it was originally pronounced as Yahuwah, okay? So I'm going to pronounce it that way. Um, you know, so, you know, in, in the uh, King James Version, you see, for example, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The capitals, the all capitals Lord is actually a substitution of the Tetragrammaton, the name of the Lord, yud heh wow heh or in you know, modern uh, uh, Hebrew, be yod heh vav heh okay? So, um, yeah, I'm not going to pronounce it as the yod heh vav heh I'm going to pronounce it as the old, uh, the very ancient form where the Vav was pronounced as a wow. Okay, so uh, when you see the capitals, L-O-R-D, we know that it came from uh, the original uh, tetragrammaton, yod heh wow heh which is, which is pronounced, uh, as I believe, it's pronounced as Yahuwah. Um, now, in books like the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Enoch, I'm not 100% sure exactly what here when it says lord if it's actually uh from if if in the original manuscripts it actually has the you know the name of god in there or whether it has something like adonai which means lord okay and and we know that in in the bible most of the times when you see the word lord it means yud he wow he okay yahuwah but sometimes especially when it's a capital l small o small small r small d it means it's it's translated from the hebrew adonai which is really not a name per se. It's a title or, you know, Lord, basically. That's what it means. Um, but uh, yud he wow he does not mean Lord. <laughs> it means something completely different. And that's for another whole video, okay? So just as a brief introduction, we're going to do this chronologically. We're going to go through the uh, the scriptures, pronouncing the original names as best as possible as they were they were originally pronounced. And we're going to we're going to pronounce the name of God as Yahuwah. Okay. Um, I don't think that you should be or anybody should be really hung up on the pronunciation of names. Okay. I mean, my name is Christopher. Some people call me Christopher. I, I mean, whatever you call me, I still will respond to you, okay? Whether you call Jesus, Jesus, or Yeshua, or whatever you call him, as long as you do it out of a pure heart and, you, and, you, and, and, and he knows who you're, who you're calling, I think that, uh, that he, he, he can and he will respond. Um, so yes, uh, Yeshua does respond to the name Jesus, 
so I don't think we should get really, really hung up on all these names, but I think it's very, very interesting to know how it was originally pronounced, okay? Say you go to heaven and you, and you, know, and, and you meet someone who says, hi, I'm Yaakov. You're like, Yaakov, what's that? I mean, it's good to know and it, Yaakov is Jacob. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not to say that that will happen, but you, I think you understand what I'm talking about. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to be using some of the um, books such as the Book of Jubilees, Book of Enoch, because they were uh, considered by some in the biblical times, especially in the times of the first century and, and you know, previous to the first century, as authentic scripture found in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I'm going to start with the book of Jubilees, chapter 1. Unlike almost every, um, unlike every other uh, daily reading I've ever come across, but, you know, they started at Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to start at Jubilees, chapter 1, because the book of Jubilees paints, you know, kind of sets the stage for the, for the book of Genesis. It tells us a lot of things about the book of Genesis that the book of Genesis does not tell us, okay? It answers a lot of questions that the book of Genesis does not tell answer okay so uh yeah i think it's important that we read and understand the book of jubilees as we know that a lot of people did back in the biblical times okay so without any further ado let's get on with this the book of jubilees chapter one i'm going to begin at the introduction here this is the history of the division of the days of the law and of the testimony of the events of the years of their year weeks. Okay, now I'm going to stop there just for a second. And I'm going to do this throughout the whole time of scripture reading because I don't believe we should just, you know, read through everything without actually stopping to ponder and, un and meditate on what we've just read. So let's do this together, okay? Um, year weeks. Now, today, whenever you hear the word week, I mean, everybody thinks about seven days. But here in the book of Jubilees, I think it's very important for you, for you to understand that it's talking about year weeks, not week of uh, a week of days, but a week of years, seven years, not seven days, but seven years. Very interesting, very important to understand as we're reading this, okay? Of their jubilees throughout all the years of the world, as the Lord spake to Moshe on Mount Sinai, when he, when he went up to receive the tablets of the law and of the commandment, according to the voice of God, as he said unto him, go up to the top of the mount. Very good. Very interesting. Chapter 1. And it came to pass in the first year of the Exodus, in other words, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt, in the third month, on the sixteenth day of the month, that God spake to Moshe, saying, Come up to me on the mount, and I will give you two tablets of stone of the law and of the commandment, which I have written, that you may teach them. Okay, let's stop there again. God said, This is the reason why I'm giving you these uh, commandments. I'm giving you the tablets of stone with the commandments on it, so that you may teach them. You know, it's not just so you can have it as a, you know, um, <laughs> you know, a souvenir. No, it's, it's so that you may teach them, okay? And Moshe went up into the Mount of God. Very interesting. They call it the Mount of God. And the glory of the Lord abode, rested, you know, lived, kind of stayed on the Mount Sinai. And a cloud overshadowed it six days. And he called to Mo Moshe on the seventh day out in the midst of the cloud. And the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a flaming fire on top of the mount. So here we got, okay, here we got the glory of the Lord uh, that was in the appearance of a cloud and fire, okay? Now, picture this for a second. Moshe, Moses went up to the mountain, went up to Mount, mount Sinai. Now, you think that, you know, like a lot of people today think that God just speaks instantaneously. And a lot of these so-called prophets today, you know, just, you know, they they kind of turn God on and off at, at will. But here, Moshe waited a whole six days before God actually spoke. Now, you know, here again, we've got the presence of presence of God, you might call it the presence of God, the glory of God, the cloud appearing, the fire burning for six whole days. But that was not the the voice of the Lord. Some people, especially in you know, and you know, you got these 
fringe charismatic groups, they think that the cloud and the glory is the voice of God. No, it's not. Here we got the cloud, the glory, the glory meaning the beauty of the Lord it appeared at like fire in a cloud. This was on the mount six days. So Moshe, Moses was just basking in this glory for six whole days before God actually even spoke. God spoke on the seventh day. Very interesting. Now in context, um, the seventh day would be Shabbat or the Sabbath. Today, it is Saturday. So very interesting that God would wait until the Sabbath, Shabbat, to speak. Okay, He didn't speak on any of the other six days. He spoke on Shabbat. He waited. Okay, Can you imagine what it would be like to be Moses? Moshe, up on the top of the mount for six whole days, waiting for God to speak. Did he even know that God would speak? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. He just obeyed God's voice, come up to the mount. So he went up there, and he just waited. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited for six whole days. And finally, God spoke on the seventh day. And Moshe was on the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, wait a second. Again here, Moshe was on the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Isn't this familiar? This is a familiar number. We've got Noah who that was in the ark and it was raining for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, now he was in the ark for much longer than that. But he was in the ark and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. We've got Jesus. We've got Yeshua who went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, if you know the rest of the, the, the whole scope of Scripture in the, in the context here, we know that Moshe, Moses fasted as well. So something about this number, 40 days and 40 nights, how it just kind of coincides. And we can talk about this later, how uh, the 40 days and 40 nights is you know coincides with the same 40 days and 40, day, uh, 40 nights of Noah and the same 40 days and 40 nights of Yeshua, okay? And you know what? Let me just touch on it, okay? 40 days and 40 nights where Noah was in the ark and it was raining, okay? This, and at the end, it was like the, the it was like a, a flood. It was like a, a huge, 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 uh, the ultimate baptism, okay? Whereas Yeshua went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and after that, he got baptized, okay? Very interesting. I mean, there's a lot of things that just coincide here. A lot of things that just, just tie in together. Uh, parables, if you will. Types and shadows. It's awesome, okay? Let's continue. And God taught him the earlier and the later history of the division of all the days of the law and of the testimony. He said, incline your ear to every word which I shall speak to you on this mount and write them in a book in order that their generations may see that uh, how I have not forsaken them for all the evil which they have wrought in transgressing the covenant which I established between me and you for their generations to this, uh, this day on Mount Sinai. Okay, so God's, God said to Moshe, okay, um, I am giving you, uh, uh, you know, listen to every word that I speak and, uh, and write them in a book, you know, remember them uh, in order that, okay, this is the purpose. This is the purpose in order that their generations, you know, the, the descendants of, you know, the descendants of faith, the descendants of the children of Israel, and even today we can claim this, in order that their generations may see how I have not forsaken them for all the evil which they have wrought in transgressing the covenant which I established between me and you for their generations this day on Mount Sinai. Okay. God, I mean, let's, again, let's ponder this a second, okay? Let's ponder this a moment. God said to Moshe, this is the reason why I'm giving you these commandments. This is the reason why I'm commanding you to write them, write it down. Write it down so that people like you and me can read it. And people like, you know, all the past generations of the children of Israel can read it and, and know that 
uh, that God has not forsaken them for all the evil that they have done by transgressing that covenant. Okay? By sinning against that covenant. Very interesting now. I mean, this is like, think about it for a second. This is really a very, very loving note, footnote, if you will, that God gave Moshe. Oh, by the way, I'm telling you this so that you would not forget, that you would, that you would know that I have not forsaken you. I have not forsaken you for all the evil that you've done against me in transgressing this covenant. Now there's more. There's more. And thus it will come to pass when all these things will come upon them that they will recognize that I am more righteous than they in all their judgments and in all their actions. Here we go. God says that, you know, it will come to pass when all these things come upon them. God goes on to describe that there's going to be, you know, really hard times that are going to come upon the children of Israel. But it's so that they would know that God is more righteous than they are, or that God is more righteous than we are in all our, our judgments and all of our actions. And everybody has their own righteousness. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's the serial, serial killer in jail. I don't care if it's, uh, you know, the, the, it doesn't matter if it's the most ruthless, brutal dictator in the world. Everybody has their own righteousness. What I mean by that is they have their own idea of what right is, you know, what is right and what's wrong. They have their own judgments about righteousness. Oh, this is good. This is not good. This is, this is, this is good. This is bad. This is acceptable. This is not acceptable. Now, what God is saying here is that hard times are coming so that you will see, so that you will see that what you call acceptable and what you call unacceptable is not right, uh, is not really what God calls acceptable and not acceptable. That God is more righteous than we are in, in our judgments. God is more righteous than we are in our actions. In other words, oh, we might say, oh, that doesn't sound good. Oh, you know, God said do this. Oh, God said do that. Oh, God God looks at some people this way. God looks at some people that way. God, God speaks against this sin. God speaks against that sin. Oh, that's hate. Oh, that's hate. No, he is more righteous than we are. Okay, who are we to judge God's judgments? Who are we to judge God for what he says is right and wrong? Who are we to judge the Holy Scriptures? Who are we to judge? Okay, God says that hard times would come upon these people because they need to know that they don't make the rules here. They shouldn't make the rules here. They need to go by my rules because they're, they're better. They're more righteous. I am more righteous than they are in all their judgments and in all their actions. And let's go on here. And they will recognize that I have truly been with them. Okay, again, God just kind of sandwiches all of this into like a very loving, a very loving, uh, a very loving thing to say. I mean, he says, you know, I'm giving you these commandments. I'm, I'm giving you all this so that you would know that I have not forsaken you. And you're going to go through some hard times because you're going to transgress this covenant. But you're going to go through some hard times and I'm going to press, I'm going to, I'm going to press the evil out of you because you need to realize that your judgments, your standards of living is not the right standard of living. I am more righteous than you. In other words, God says, I, what I, my judgments, my laws, my views on what's acceptable and not acceptable is a whole lot more righteous, a whole lot more better, you know, a whole lot more wise, correct than yours is, okay? And also, that they will recognize that, that I have truly been with them. So it's like, you know what, I'm going to chastise them. I'm going to put them through hard times. But through it all, they will recognize that I have been truly with them. Hmm. That is a very loving thing for God to say because, I mean, God is 
basically saying, listen, don't worry, I'm not going to forsake you. You're going to get it for your sin, but you know, uh, you need to realize that uh, I am truly with you. And you need to realize you need to bow, so to speak, to my laws, to my ways, not your ways, not your laws, not the law of man, but the law of God. And do thou write for yourself. In other words, write, write for yourself all these words which I declare un, un, uh, unto you this day. For I know their rebellion and their stiff neck. And this is, again, bring it all into focus here. God is speaking to Moshe, speaking about the children of Israel. Before I bring them into the land of which I swear to their fathers, to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, saying, Unto your seed I will give a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will eat and be satisfied, and they will turn to strange gods. Okay? And, as we read through the scriptures, you're going to see this. You're going to see, you know, the people of God, they get blessed of God. And when they get blessed, I mean, it's just like a natural thing to do. They get proud. They get pride in their hearts. And they turn away from God. They think that they don't need God anymore. They kind of just kind of walk away from God or trample on God in some, you know, some situations. But, you know, it's always like that. It's like a, it's like um. A cycle, you know, you know, people get blessed and God blesses them so much and then they get so proud, so proud and, and, and God hates pride. He said, I oppose the proud. I, in, in, in the original manuscripts, in the original language, it means I stand in battle formation against the proud, but I give grace to the humble. So God sees their pride and because of their pride, they sin and God crushes them and they become humble. And they lose a lot. And then they start again at the bottom. And God blesses them because of their humility, blesses them because of their obedience, blesses them because of their obedience and humility, blesses them and blesses them and blesses them and blesses them. Again, until then, again, they reach the top of blessing and then they get proud again, turn their backs on God or forget God. And then sin, uh, you know, creeps in, corruption, and God strikes them and they fall back down and they're humble again, okay? So here we go. Uh, and they will eat and be satisfied. They will be blessed. And they will turn to strange gods, to gods which cannot deliver them from aught of their tribulation. In other words, these gods cannot deliver them from, from any of the evil that they're going through, any of the hard times they're going through, any of the tests and trials they're going through. These gods just can't deliver them. Pray all you want, but you're not going to be delivered. You're going to be... You know, you're just bang, you're just speaking into the air, banging your head off, banging your uh, banging your head against the wall, and this witness shall be heard for a witness against them. And what witness? The witness of the the law, the witness of the law of God, the standards of God, uh, the commandments of God. For they will forget all my commandments, even all that I command them, and they will walk after the Gentiles. Gentiles here meaning non-Jews or unbelievers, people who really don't believe or go by the ways of God. They go by their own ways. They go by the ways of man. They go by the ways of the land. They go by the ways of society, but they don't go by the ways of God. The Gentiles, the heathens, in other words. Uh, some, some translations call it the heathens. So God's saying that his people will be uh, blessed. They will turn from God uh, they will walk away from his commandments and they will walk after the Gentiles. In other words, they will do things that only ungodly, unbelieving people do. And after their uncleanness and after their shame, after the shame of these unbelievers, ungodly people, these people that don't really care about God's ways and will, and will serve their gods and and these will prove unto them an offense and a tribulation and an affliction and a snare. A snare being a trap. These people, these people. I mean, God didn't say, oh, just go love the Gentiles. And remember, God said in Malachi, in, in Malachi, he said, I am Yahuwah. I am the Lord. I am Yahuwah. I am Yahweh. I change not. Okay? He doesn't change from Genesis to Revelation. He doesn't change. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't say, 
oh, I think I'm going to change my ways now. Oh, maybe I maybe I'm just kind of turning over a new leaf here. I'm, I'm, I'm going going into a new new phase. No, 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 he doesn't. Uh, it says many, many times in, in, in the Torah, in his commandments, listen, I, you know, this is perpetual. This is forever. This is everlasting. Um, so it doesn't change. He doesn't change. His law doesn't change. So, uh, you know, his people going after the ways of the Gentiles, walking as the heathen walk, walking as the unbelievers walk, going after their, you know, doing what they do, hanging out with them, fellowshipping with them, um, doing what they do. Uh, God says, that's not good. I mean, come out from among them, says the Lord. You know, be separate and, and I will receive you. I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters. Prove on, uh, so, excuse me, um, they will go after the ways of the Gentiles, and uh, that will prove unto them an offense and a tri and a tribulation. Tribulation meaning really bad hardship. I mean, hard times, seriously hard times, and an affliction and a snare, a trap. And many will perish. Wow, many will die, and they will be taken captive and will fall into the hands of the enemy. Because they have forsaken my ordinances and my commandments and my festivals of my covenant and my Sabbaths and my holy place, which I have hollowed for myself in their midst and my tabernacle and my sanctuary, which I have hollowed for myself in, their, in the midst of the land, that I should set my name upon it that they or, and that it should dwell there. That's a lot of things here. God goes through a whole command, a whole list of things here of, of, of things that his people failed to do. Okay. And they will make to themselves high places and groves and graven images and, and uh, they will worship each his own graven image so as to go astray. And they will sacrifice their children to demons. Okay, so many of us would, would read this and it would just kind of go right over our head. Now, the modern day equivalent to sacrificing your children to demons is abortion. Okay, having, you know, conceiving children and just sacrificing them off in the name of Reproductive freedom or whatever you might want to whitewash it as, okay? That is sacrificing your children to demons. And to the work of all the error of their hearts. Again, this could go to a lot of different uh, things. This could be speaking of sexual immorality um, and all the different error, and the work of the error of their hearts and the error as defined in God's law. That's the only way to define error. You can't go by your own work. Like, like we talked about earlier, you can't go by your own definition of what was right and wrong. You got to go by what God's definition of right and wrong is. His eternal word, as it says in Psalms 119, thy word is forever settled in heaven. And I will send witnesses unto them. So witnesses being prophets. I mean, people, you know, standing on the street corner saying, repent. That's witness. You got to, it's the, it's the age old uh, message of repentance. That I am my witness against them, but they will not hear. They will not hear. And they will slay the witnesses also. They'll kill them. And they will persecute those who seek the law. And they will abrogate and change everything so that, so, uh, so as to work evil before my eyes. Now, persecute those who seek the law. You know, we know in Yeshua, Jesus said, blessed are those uh, who um, are persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, he, I know a lot of evangelical Christians, a lot of Christians today would kind of twist that to mean, well, blessed are you if you're persecuted for Jesus sake. That's not what he said. He didn't say you're blessed if you're persecuted for your faith, uh, for, uh, for, for uh, your professing in Jesus. No. He said, blessed are you if you're persecuted for righteousness sake. In other words, if you do what's right, again, according to God's law, if you do what's right and you're persecuted for it, then you're blessed is what Yeshua said. But uh, God says here, well, he prophesied that, that people will get persecuted for seeking the law. They will abrogate 
and change everything so as to work evil before my eyes. Abrogate means to uh, to nullify something that's before, to bring something new in, okay? To, to replace the old with the new, to abrogate and change everything so as to work evil before my eyes. So how can you abrogate to, to work evil? Because there are lots of people today who say that God's law is abrogated, that it is replaced by the new covenant. They don't know what covenant really is. They don't know what testament really is. It's not the law. <laughs> Just because Bible publishers slap everything together and label it Old Testament doesn't mean that everything in there is an Old Testament. They don't even know what it means by Old Testament, okay? There are many testaments in the so-called scope of the Old Testament. You know, when they... You know, there are many testaments between Genesis and Malachi. Put it that way. There are many testaments. Okay? And the law, God's law, God's eternal word is not a testament. It is not a testament in and of itself. It is the law. Okay? Again, look in my blog posts, uh, you know, the, the New Testament versus Old Testament and such to get a lot more detail uh, and explanation and education re require, uh, regarding the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, very interesting. We're going to get in, we're going to get into this in all of our studies. Okay, so uh, they will abrogate and change everything so as to work evil before my eyes. How are they going to do that? Obviously, they're going to say, "Oh, God, you know, you don't have to do that no more. You don't have to obey God anymore. You don't have to obey this word anymore. It's abrogated by something else. It's replaced by something new." No, it's not. And I will hide my face from them, and I will deliver them into the hand of the Gentiles for captivity and for prey and for devouring. I will remove them from the midst of the land and scatter them among the Gentiles. Again, I mean, you can look at this and say this was fulfilled in uh, the captivity into Babylon, where the children of Israel went into Babylon. You can say this was fulfilled in uh, the Holocaust. Okay, I mean, you know, the Gentiles being the non-Jews or being the, the people who are disobeying or disbelieving God doesn't go, the, the, the people who do not go by God's word, uh, they will, uh, I will deliver them into the hand of the Gentiles for captivity, for prey and for devouring. Doesn't that sound like a Holocaust to, to you? Um, I will remove them from the midst of the land and I will scatter them among the Gentiles. Again, scatter them out of the land of Israel. And they will forget all my law and my commandments and all of my judgments and will go astray as to new moons and Sabbaths and festivals and jubilees and ordinances. Again, here God is very specific about what he means by going astray. They're not, they're not obeying. They're not observing new moon festivals, uh, Sabbaths, festi uh, other festivals, jubilees or ordinances anymore. And after this, they will turn to me from among the Gentiles with all their heart and all their soul and all their strength, and I will gather them from among all the Gentiles, and they will seek me, so, at, so, that, they, so that I shall be found of them. Awesome. He's going to gather them in, which happened already. If you're looking at it like in regards to uh, the land of Israel today, the Jewish people are gathered back in, from, and they're still coming in from all over the world. So we see this fulfilled uh, even in recent times. When they seek me with all their heart and with all their soul, I will disclose to them abounding peace with righteousness. I will remove them the plant of uprightness with all my heart and all my soul, and they shall be for a blessing and not a curse. I mean, the people of Israel today are for a blessing. They are, uh, there's a lot of wonderful technology and advancement that's coming in blessing that, that's, that has come upon the world through Israel. I mean, awesome study to, to, look, to, look, to look at what actually Israel produced since its rebirth. Um, I will be their God. Oh, excuse me here. They shall be the head and not the tail. I and, and I will build my sanctuary in their midst. In other words, I will live in their midst, or I will live in them. I will be in them. I will dwell with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people in truth and righteousness. Doesn't that sound like uh, the end of Book of Revelation, where God says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people? Go, uh, moving on here, and I will not forsake them nor fail them, for I am the Lord their God. 
And Moshe fell on his face and prayed, O Lord my God, do not forsake your people and your inheritance, so that they should wander in the error of their hearts. Do not deliver them into the hand of their enemies, the Gentiles, lest they should rule over them and cause them to sin against you. Let your mercy, O Lord, be lifted up upon your people and create in, in them an upright spirit and let them uh, and let not the spirit of Belial or Belial rule over them to accuse them before you and to ensnare them from uh, from all the paths of righteousness so that they may perish from before your face. Let's just go back here this last sentence that we read. I will create in them an upright spirit, renew a right spirit within me, says uh, Daoud, says David in Psalm 51. Isn't this very familiar? Now, you know, assuming this text did exist in David's time, in Daoud's time, where did he get that from? You know, when David prayed, when Daoud prayed, you know, create in me a steadfast spirit, an upright spirit, a right spirit within me. You know, and do not... Uh, do not let the spirit of Belier rule over them. Okay, Belier is where we get our name liar from, which is which means worthless. It means um, Belier here in this context means Satan. Okay, in uh, other uh, places in Scripture you'll see the word Belial, which again speaks of Satan. Uh, worthless is really what it means. And this is again this is where we get our our word liar from. Uh, so do not let the spirit of Satan, more or less, rule over them and accuse them before you. Okay, so this is, it says again in the book of Revelation that Satan accuses the brothers, accuses the brethren, and accuses the believers before the throne of God. So it, that's what Satan does. That's what Belial does. That is what Belial does, is accuse them, being the believers, being the, the people who are really the people of God. To ensnare them from all the paths of righteousness. In other words, to, um, uh, to keep them from walking in the law of God. So that they may perish from before your face. Okay? I mean, that's the goal here of Satan is to cause people to stray from the law of God. Stray from the ways of God. So that they may die. So that they may perish. So that they may find their eternity in hellfire. But they... Are, they, are your people and your inheritance. Okay, again, this is Moshe, this is Moses praying to God. They are your people, your inheritance, which you have delivered with your great power from the hands of the Egyptians. Create in them a, a clean heart and a Holy Spirit. Again, wow, this sounds a whole lot like Psalm 51. Again, Assuming this text is for real, and a lot of people believe it is, and even the ancients believe it is, why shouldn't we believe it is? I mean, there's I, this video is not about that per, per se, but let's say, for example, it is. This is really uh, this this uh, text really came from the days of Mo, Moshe, and we got no evidence against that. I mean. There's no evidence that anybody else wrote it, actually wrote it. We've got copies, like for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls that date back, you know, to the second century BC. But that doesn't mean that that's when they were written. That doesn't mean that. Um, I know there are other arguments saying, well, it was written around that time because of this, because of that. And that but it, it, these arguments, it, that doesn't mean that, okay? Um, it could be that that was just a copy, and I believe it was just a copy of the original. Uh, yes, the uh, the copy, uh, the copy manuscript from the Dead Sea Scrolls was dated in the second century BC, but that was a copy of another, of another, of another, of another, of another, and bow all the way back to Moshe's time. Create uh, in them a clean heart and a holy spirit. Again, David. Dawood prayed in Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart and a steadfast spirit, a right spirit, a holy spirit. Do not take your holy spirit from me. And let them not be ensnared in their sins from henceforth in, in, until eternity. Again, if this text is for real, okay, if some of the church, early church fathers are true in what they say that this is actually scripture, if it's for real, then David took his prayer in Psalm 51 from this scripture. 
Okay, from this scripture, he took it. Powerful. This is awesome facts right here. And the Lord said to Moshe, this is the Lord's reply. I know their contrariness and their thoughts and their stiff neckedness, their stubbornness, in other words. And they will not be obedient until they confess their own sin and the sin of their fathers. And after this, they will turn to me in all uprightness and with all their heart and with all their soul. And I will circumcise the foreskin of their heart. Very interesting little phrase here. Circumcise the foreskin of their heart. Again, we find this in other passages of Scripture. Okay, in particular, I believe it's Isaiah. We find this in, we say, circumcise your heart. Circumcise your heart. I mean, again, if this... Pat, if this book is for real, if the, if the book of Jubilees is for real, then Isaiah and other places in the Bible that has this phrase, it came from this book. Okay, It was inspired at least from the, these writings. And the foreskin of the heart of their seed. Now, let me just back up a second again here and just uh, explain what this really means. Circumcise the foreskin of their heart. So if you're a sinner, if you're an unbeliever, if you uh, are against God, uh, if, you have an ad if your attitude is against God, you have a hard heart. You have what, how the, what the scriptures call the heart of stone. So uh, you need to have a circumcision of your heart. You need to break that stone away. You need to peel that back. You need to cut that away. And, and come to God with a, with a pure heart, a heart of love, a heart of soft, a soft heart of love toward God and toward others in righteousness and truth according to God's law. So to circumcise the foreskin of your heart is actually to come back to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which, which means to obey Him and to love one another. Again, obeying God. And I will create in them a Holy Spirit, and I will cleanse them so that they shall not turn away from me from that day until eternity. Again, it sounds a whole lot like the book of Revelation at the end, doesn't it? And their souls will cleave unto me and to all my commandments, and they will fulfill my commandments, and I will be their father, and they shall be my children. Wow, again, this is a wonderful um, little snippet here that uh, that we hear in other parts of scripture i will be their father and they shall be my children wow awesome and they all shall be called the children of the living god and every angel and every spirit shall know yea they shall know that these are my children and that i am their father in uprightness and righteousness and that i love them Powerful, powerful, powerful. Every spirit, every angel. Again, book of Hebrews talks about how the, the angels long to look into the things of salvation. Like the angels are amused, amazed at those who are actually saved. Okay, those who actually have repented from their sins and have uh, found favor with God. Okay, every angel and every spirit shall know. Yes, they shall know that these are my children, and I am their father in uprightness and righteousness, and that I love them. I love them. Okay. A very, let me just add, that's a very specific love, right? A very particular love. I love them. And do thou write, in other words, write, just simply write down for yourself all these words which I declare unto you on this mountain, the first and the last, which shall come to pass, and all the division, divisions of the days in the law and in the testimony and in the weeks and the jubilees unto eternity, until I descend and dwell with them throughout eternity. And he said to the angel of the presence, write for Moshe. Okay, this is God speaking to the angel of the presence now. Again, we see in several passages throughout Scripture, in different books, the angel of the presence. There's something, I mean, there's an angel called the angel of the presence. So God spoke to the angel of the presence and said, Write for Moses from the beginning of creation till my sanctuary has been built uh, among, among them for, for all eternity. This is powerful. I mean, this is powerful because this... this uh, substantiates and authenticates this the, the scriptures as being written not only 
written of an angel, but but commanded of God to be written. Okay, it's one thing to have a book. Okay, this is one thing too. You got to realize when you're reading the Bible. When you're reading the Bible, you got to you got to look at a passage or read the passage and say, who wrote this? Who are they? Ta- who are they, who are, who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? One of the things you should ask is, was this particular book or passage was it com- did God actually command this to be written down if God commanded it to be written down that is very substantial okay cuz let's be honest there are books that do not claim to be uh commanded of God i mean we got a lot of books that are you know i mean for example the torah you know god told moses to write it down in revelation god told john to write it down i mean and we got it in uh, the prophets god told him to write it down but there are some books that god it does not explicitly say that god told them to write it down so that those books that explicitly um how am i going to put this that explicitly uh, self-proclaimed to be the product of God's command it, it can, it are books that are uh, of greater authority than those that are not. In other words, books that explicitly state this is written because it was commanded of God to be written. That has more authority than a book that does not say that. Okay? So you understand. God did not ever tell anybody to throw a whole bunch of books together in one cover and call it the Bible. Okay, Not that it's wrong per se, but God wants us to look at every book individually as it was originally written. Okay, In the days of Yeshua, in the days of Jesus, in the days of Scripture, in the days of the Bible, they didn't have uh, Bibles. They didn't have canons. They, didn't, they, they had each book individually on scrolls. And these, uh, you know, the, the scholars and the religious people, the Pharisees, or not the Pharisees per se, but the scribes, uh, the priests, uh, the people of God, they looked at each individual scroll as an individual scroll. They look at it like, who was, you know, who wrote this? Where was it? I mean, where was it written? In what culture was it written? What time was it written? You know, uh, all this kind of stuff. It, you know, to throw everything together in one book and slap it together in one book and call it the Holy Bible. It, the only thing really good about it is convenience. Other than that, it kind of blurs the distinction between books, which God actually wants to be. You know, He wants us. He wants there to be distinction between books. Okay. Otherwise, he would have just made one book and that's it. Otherwise, Jesus would have come back to write a book. Okay, he would have had write a book in his um, in his agenda, which he didn't. And the Lord will appear to the eyes of all. Huh, it's awesome. And all shall know that I am the Lord, uh, that I am the God of Israel and the Father of all the children of Yaakov, and. King on Mount Sion for all eternity, and Sion and Jerusalem shall be holy. And the angel of the presence who went before the camp of Israel took the tablets of the division, divisions of the years, from the time of the creation of the law and of the testimony of the of the weeks of the jubilees, according to the individual years, according to all the number of the jubilees, according to the individual years. From that, or from the day of the new creation, when the heavens and the earth shall be renewed, and all their creation according to the powers of the heaven, and according to all the creation of the earth, until the sanctuary of the Lord shall be made in Jerusalem on Mount Sion, and all the luminaries be renewed. Luminaries being lights, stars, could, talk, could be talking about people, powers of the heavens, angels, whatever you want to, however you want to apply this. All the luminaries will be renewed for healing and for peace, and for blessing, and for all the elect of Israel, the elect, the chosen, those who are called, the chosen, the ones that are really saved, and that thus it may be from that day unto all the days of the earth. That concludes chapter 1 of the reading of Jubilees. Now, just before we go here, let me just, let me just go back here, this last little part we, we read. Now, doesn't this sound like the book of Revelation? I mean, it's obviously you know, from the day of the new creation when the heavens and the earth shall be renewed from all their creation according to the powers of the heaven, according to all the creation of the earth, talking about the Yerushalayim and the new heavens and the new earth, all this stuff. 
It's in the book of Revelation. Now we know we've got archaeological evidence, hard evidence, that this book, the book of Jubilees, existed before the book of Revelation. So we can we can say that there is a great possibility, very, very possible, very, very likely, that John got that information about new heavens and new earth and all that kind of stuff from the book of of Jubilees. Now, it's just wonderful to go through these scriptures like this. I'm really looking forward to really going through the rest of the scriptures with you. It's going to be an awesome, awesome, awesome time. Okay, so uh, thanks for watching and be sure to click that like button and be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.